During my talk, I'm going to focus on the Logic App piece. Uh, there are future talks talking about API apps and connectors and all that stuff. Um, I'm not going to cover all of that. Uh, but I'm going to spend just a couple minutes uh, doing a little more details on the background of Logic Apps. Um, you know, earlier, earlier today, you saw an example of kind of a code-based workflow. And that's not what we're targeting. So our goal with Logic Apps is to create a way for you to, without having to use code, create workflows. Um, so that's kind of the basis. And then you can, of course, use code as much as you want to, but you don't have to if you don't need to. Um, one of the things that we're also working on right now as we speak is getting out some, some pre-built templates that you can leverage. Um, they're not available quite yet, but they're coming very soon. And uh, we also have a whole set of samples uh, in, the, in the Azure.com documentation that you can walk through uh, that talk about the scenarios I'm going to cover here as well as some of the more BizTalk-centric scenarios. So I'd recommend checking out Azure.com documentation. Uh, there's details there. Um, and of course, we have support for uh, today. There's about 35 connectors in the, in the Azure marketplace. Um, and they're, we're adding more all the time. I think Paul showed you the, the, new, uh, the new connectors that he's working on. Um, and yeah. So uh, all of you are, are somewhat familiar with Azure. So this shouldn't really be news to you. But um, you know, I find in talking to customers, some of them ask, you know, some pretty basic questions that I just wanted to get out of the way. So people are like, hey, do you have auditing? Um, and the answer is, well, of course, because we're an Azure service and all Azure services have auditing. So at, just like for websites or for IaaS or for SQL, um, we, we have all of the capabilities that Azure services have built in. So that means all of the management operations, for example, are audited and persisted in the operational logs for your service. Um, one of the other great capabilities of Azure that we have in Logic Apps is, of course, role-based access control. So this is a new capability that was released um, within the past year, I think. And what that means is if you have certain users in your organization that you want to have specific permissions, say you want somebody to be able to just view the status of a Logic App, or you want them to be able to run it but not to change it, all of that is possible using role-based access control. And that's the same as with all other Azure services. Uh, so there's nothing special about Logic Apps here. But by virtue of being a part of Azure and a part of Azure App Service, we can take advantage of these great platform capabilities. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is uh, with resource, Azure Resource Manager, you have full deployment lifecycle control over your deployment. Uh, so you can take a single Resource Manager template, and inside it, you can contain the, the six BizTalk connectors that you need, the two SaaS connectors you need, the multiple Logic Apps together, deploy it as a single deployment into your resource group um, and manage that as a single unit. So just like you can do that with, with Azure, other Azure resources, you can do it here. Um, of course, we have the Management API, PowerShell, and uh, with the next release of the Azure Pack, um, we will have it uh, in that as well. So the way we've been thinking about this is the target audience for, uh, for Logic Apps is anybody who can use Azure. So that doesn't just mean you know, people who write code, although the vast, vast majority of Azure users do write code, but it also can be um, you know, people who have a little less familiarity with the underlying code. Um, but an important note is we are not, with the offering that we have today, targeting consumers. Uh, you may have heard people comparing the product that we have to if, the if this and that. That's not really what we're doing today. And as you think about it, as the demos you've seen already, it's somewhat more advanced than what a consumer would expect. Um, you have to come to the Azure portal for one, and the Azure portal is very focused on dev scenarios. And you're going to be exposed to concepts like resource groups and app service plans and data center locations. Uh, so the product that we have today is not targeting uh, those consumers, but we are targeting you guys. We're targeting the integration uh, developers. We're targeting the people that, that make a living uh, from, from writing these services. Uh, so uh, here's the slide of the connectors. I think you've already seen that. Uh, so to add, add a little more background, um, Azure Resource Manager was really the inspiration for Logic Apps. Uh, and today, Azure Resource Manager is a highly scalable system that uh, it processes and handles millions of resources. And it, it's really the engine that powers the underlying core of Azure. Um, so when we talk about Resource Manager, there's a couple different points. Uh, at the top, you have the Management API, which is shared. But really, the piece that we've taken for Logic Apps is that middle layer. Uh, that middle layer today, what it can do things like, it can take 
uh, let's say you want to deploy a WordPress website. Uh, and you have a SQL database associated with that WordPress website. The resource manager, what that does is it can deploy the website and deploy the database and it can flow the connection string uh, from the database into the config of the website and then configure it. Um, that may sound familiar because that actually is the exact same type of system that we've set up for Logic Apps. You know, that Twitter to Dropbox scenario um, actually is very similar uh, in, in that. You can, Resource Manager also supports even more complex things like uh, deploying a SharePoint, highly available SharePoint farm with four different roles, with AD set up, all kind of interconnecting that. So that's, uh, that's what uh, really inspired Logic Apps uh, in its current incarnation. Um, so the engine that runs Azure today is the same engine that runs Logic App. So it can handle you know, thousands of parallel deployments. It's resilient against failure. So we have at least once message guarantee. Uh, so if you know, something, there's a transient error and it, it fails, we can retry that and we can retry that until it succeeds. Um, just like between Resource Manager and Logic Apps, you have a single, uh, a simple JSON file that defines what you want to do. The language is a little different between the two systems, but um, the, the overall concepts are the same. And one other interesting point is we automatically infer uh, the relationships between resources and Resource Manager, and we automatically infer dependencies between actions inside a Logic App. So that makes it a little different from your traditional workflow where you say, you know, step one and then step two or step three and then step four. It's not quite sequential like that. Instead, what you do is you say kind of your, the, the actions that you need and you flow the data between them and we will automatically generate a dependency graph uh, for you. So this is just uh, showing, we, we, you know, on the left, that's uh, Azure Resource Manager template small text, I don't necessarily expect you to be able to see it, but you can see both are JSON uh, and they both have similar concepts. Um, but what's really great about Logic Apps is we've added, we've expanded on it quite extensively uh, to make it a, a, more, a more powerful offering for you guys. And for example, Resource Manager has eight functions and today we have over 50 functions that are possible to use inside of Logic Apps. Um, you, know, for you, guys, you can think of them as functoids, they're uh, the same, same concept. Uh, the functions that we have support a uh, wide variety of operations. There's math operations, so you can do addition or mod or generate random numbers, set operations to do union and intersect, uh, string manipulations, uh, and logical operators. Uh, so over 50 functions are possible. Um, resource Manager is really targeting resources in Azure, whereas with Logic Apps, you can target any arbitrary HTTP endpoint. So we've talked about using API apps as the kind of the connectors, but you don't have to use API apps. You can use Logic Apps to call to any REST endpoint that exists on the internet. Um, so if you want just to make, make a simple API call, uh, you can do that natively. Um, I mentioned this earlier, we also support several different forms of authentication. Uh, so if you have a service that requires a cert, um, you can use that as a part of Logic Apps. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm gonna jump into a scenario right now. And this scenario is a little bit different in that it actually uses a, a mobile app, uh, which I'm gonna run on my laptop. There we go, okay. So this is, this is a, it's just a simple, a simple list. Um, and I can add new items to this list. And when I do, uh, what it's gonna do is it's actually gonna send a text message. Um, so let's take a look and see what this, uh, this app looks like running in Azure. And so this is, a, it's an app that's meant to uh, track invoices. Uh, so it has a simple text message action. Um, and you'll notice it just doesn't have a recurrence. So this actually uses, instead of, uh, you know, pulling on some endpoint and getting a response back, it actually, the data flows directly from the mobile app into, in this case, a Twilio connector. So this is, uh, it'll receive the phone number and send it, so this is, my phone and hopefully this will work. So I'm gonna create a new invoice here um, and we need you know, um, microphone clips and uh, let's get two of these and I'm gonna click save here in this app and there we go. So now hopefully what's gonna happen is it's going to call into Twilio and uh, send me a text message. You see, there you go. 
Um, so uh, you can see that, that was definitely faster than a minute delay um, because that was, instead of using a polling, it actually used um, a, a callback URI. So every, every workflow exposes a direct access endpoint that you can call from your own applications. So if you have a mobile application like I just showed, uh, you can use it there. But you also can have another web service that's running that can call directly into the workflow uh, to initiate, initiate that. Um, so next what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another step to this workflow. And you can see here um, there's a variety of connectors that I've already created and put in this app service plan, so I can use them here. And I'm just going to use a Yammer connector. And as with uh, the connectors we've seen before, um, it's going to show me the action that I want to perform. And for uh, the, the other thing I can show is, um, you know, people have asked me, can I have uh, steps that refer to something that's not immediately preceding it? So in this case, there, there's the, the webhook on the left there, and then there's the, the, the message. And you can actually reference content from any previous step in the workflow. So you don't have to just have an entirely sequential flow. You can reference steps from the beginning. If I had 10 different steps, I could actually reference something from the very first step if I wanted. Um, so it, it, it's, you, we don't need the concept, of, for example, of promotion uh, because we have this capability. Uh, so I'm going to uh, put the message. And then let me just find the Yammer group that I'm going to use. How many people actually use Yammer? Oh, wow. That's really impressive. I'm, I'm glad. Um, so I'm going to paste that in and click Save. So, so now, uh, when I hit Save, it's going to automatically update that workflow. So without modifying the Yammer, or sorry, without modifying this app, I can click Add New Item. And uh, I'll just make that visibly different. And hit Save. And now what's going to happen is, in addition to sending the text message, it will also, uh, so there's a text message. It will also add something to this Yammer feed. You see, it already showed up. It, Yammer automatically refreshes. But you can see that was actually very fast. Uh, so uh, what I'm showing here is uh, I was able to improve the business logic of that, that mobile application without ever pushing a new update to customers. Because we separated out the business logic uh, that was running on the client from the logic that's running in the cloud. If you run the, written this traditionally, you may have had that mobile app call out to those two different services, and you'd have to push a new version and wait for people to update. But by separating out that logic and running it in the cloud, uh, you're really able to uh, achieve a much more agile development pattern. Uh, so let's uh, switch back to slides. Uh, so I, I was talking about dependencies, and dependencies are uh, very important. So the first thing that, that we showed in the, in the in Karan's talk was what we call an implicit dependency. So when you have a, a Twitter search and you reference the content of that Twitter search in the subsequent step, that means implicitly the second step can only run after the first step has completed. And what that does mean, for example, is if the Twitter search had failed, the Dropbox step would not try to execute because it doesn't have the information that it needs in order to complete its step. Uh, the next type of dependency that we have is an explicit depends on condition. So whenever you add a step into the designer, uh, we just add a depends on so that way it stacks nice and linearly. And all that means is the subsequent step will execute after the first one. There isn't any data flow between the two steps, uh, but it does enforce an ordering. And finally, the most complex scenario is uh, you can write expressions to connect up different steps. Uh, so this is particularly useful uh, if you want to write uh, conditional logic, uh, which I will cover in a little bit. Uh, but it also uh, means that uh, you can have uh, compensation steps written into your workflow. So for example, uh, let's say that this Dropbox step had failed. And I want to send me an email every time that Dropbox fails. I could add another step after this, and I could have it depend on uh, the code of the action uh, equaling internal server error. Uh, so that actually will only execute that compensation step 
when there's a failure in the previous step. And you can make this as complex as you'd like. Um, with, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, we support Boolean expressions and logical expressions. So I could do if this and this or this, but not this, you know, all those types of complex things, which uh, you can imagine. Uh, and the, the other thing to keep in mind is what this means is uh, if you don't have a dependency between two steps, they will run in parallel. Uh, so if you, for example, have two uh, separate series of logic, um, they will execute independent of each other until such time as there's a single action that depends on the outputs of both of those. Uh, so you can, in fact, have a fork, um, execute two separate things, and then join back later. Uh, the other thing that is a little bit different about this demo is uh, it had a different type of trigger. And we actually support uh, four different types of triggering today. Uh, the simplest is a recurring. Uh, so that's the, the first one I showed, where every x amount of time. Uh, the second one is we can pull an endpoint for a response. Uh, so there are a variety of connectors that are already showing this pattern today. And the way that works is we call into the connector, and it returns back either a 200, OK, with some content. And what we'll do then is we'll go and execute the workflow. But if it returns back a 202, uh, which is HTTP accepted, then we will wait and not start the workflow. Uh, so this is how a connector can signal that it does or does not have content that it would like to pass into the workflow and to initiate it. Uh, so you can use this polling pattern yourself. And it's important to keep in mind, you know, historically, people may have written these services that poll internally. So it, as an FTP connector, for example, you may write a job that wakes up every, every minute and, and polls to see if there's a new file in FTP. We don't need to do that anymore because the polling has been externalized into the, the Logic App system. In order to make this possible, there's one other thing that we support, which is the ability to pass the state from trigger execution to trigger execution. So just as you can pass data from subsequent actions inside of a single logic app, you can actually pass data back, or not back in time, but uh, forward in time. Uh, so if I say I have a connector that pulls FTP, I can look at the previous execution of that, that, execu of that trigger and see what files it returns. That way I don't return any duplicate files the next time that it executes. Uh, and that's good because that allows you to externalize your state and your connectors can be stateless, um, and the state actually lives in the workflow engine. Uh, another capability we support is there are certain connectors that can register to push into a workflow. Uh, so that's the example that, uh, that you saw earlier with the HTTP uh, listener and the, that, that workflow. Um, and in that case, we actually call the connector, and we give it, a, we give it that same webhook callback, callback URL. And then the connector can call into the workflow to initiate it. Uh, of course, we support the basic webhook, which is just a post to a URL. And you can go to the portal. You can get that URL and use it. And uh, in order to make your life easier, we support basic auth for that, that callback URL, so that way you don't have to use AD. Uh, but if you want to use AD, you can. Um, and it's not really a trigger type, but you can manually run a flow. And I think I showed that earlier as well, uh, where I just click the Run Now button, and it just runs. So uh, the next thing that I wanted to cover was uh, you know, a couple more complex concepts like repeats and conditionals. Uh, so I actually gave a, a peek into a repeat earlier. And uh, let's take a look at that, that workflow, if I can find my mouse. That's fine. And let's see. Um, so if we go to my Dropbox, we're probably going to see a whole ton of files now just being spewed into my uh, folders. And this, this isn't, a, isn't a particularly good experience, right? Um, so let's, let's modify this workflow a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to come back here. Yeah, so these are, these are all of the tweets that, that have been returned about Azure. And uh, so you, you saw the, the repeat, which is the array that we take. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to come here, and I'm actually going to, to modify this a little bit more. Uh, so I'm going to do a couple things. The first is um, one of the most important functions that we support is called concat, which allows you to join uh, strings together. Uh, so, for example, I could type here uh, concat 
And then if I want to, for example, let's say I want to create a folder to put all these tweets in, so that way they're not all in the root of the root of my Dropbox, I can just type you know, folder name. And then I can do close quote. And now this will concat, the, the, the file path will be a concatenation of the folder name and the tweet ID. So that way all of the, the tweets go into that folder. Um, we, and concat, especially because we also have one other shorthand that's a lot easier to write than that. Um, and this is, I don't know if any of you have heard of string interpolation. Uh, it's a relatively newish concept, but instead of typing the function concat, I can just type at and then a curly brace. And I can close the curly brace there. Now I can type dot txt. Uh, so what this will do is this will take the tweets and upload them into a folder called folder name. Uh, the file name will be the tweet ID, and then it will have an extension .txt. Um, so if you had a, you know, a more complex field that you wanted to build up, it would probably become unwieldy to write a bunch of concat functions. Instead, you can just drop these parameters in uh, and be able to use them that way. So the other thing that I want to do is I want to only upload those tweets which have a certain number of retweets. Um, to lessen the bar, let's make that greater than zero. So when you click on this gear, uh, just like there's repeat, you can also add a condition to be met. So you can use this to do filtering, for example. Here, I'm passing an array, and I only want those tweets which have some number of retweets. In this case, let's say I want it to be greater, and uh, let's say greater than zero. Now let me just grab the retweets. So I'm going to use the property retweet count. Retweet. And this acts as a, as a filter. So uh, just as you can use conditions to uh, only execute steps uh, as a compensation, you can also use filtering like this to execute steps um, for some criteria that's been met. And actually, uh, this is a mistake I make a lot. You can only put at at the beginning. Once you're in an expression, you don't need to put the at sign anymore. Uh, so the at sign kind of is an indication that this thing is an expression. Um, anyway, so, uh, so we have greater than, and then so basically the retweet count uh, has to be greater than zero. So let's commit this change and then hit save over here. And that turned green. So now, ideally, uh, let's just run it once rather than wait a minute. And we can come in here and we can look at this run and see exactly what's happened. So it's still running. Um, one other capability that we're releasing probably tomorrow is you can cancel uh, running workflows. So in this case, while this step is running, there, there's going to be a, a new button at the top to click on cancel. And you can click that, and it will actually uh, stop the workflow, let's say, if this got stuck while, is, you know, say it's looping over 10 million tweets or something. Uh, you could actually stop that in line. Uh, so it's running. So let's take a look at my Dropbox and see there's a folder called folder name. It got added. Yes, there is. So you see uh, there's folder name. And this is, again, the concatenation of uh, the tweet ID and the text. I can come in here and, uh, oh. So, so there you go. Uh, people are being very helpful. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, and what's interesting is that means somebody must have retweeted this as well, because if the retweet count is greater than 0, um, so that, that means people are really getting engaged, which I love. Um, so yeah, so let's uh, just do a quick recap. So uh, four repeats uh, that allows you to uh, loop over a list. Um, one of the functions that we support is we have a, a range function that you can use. So let's say that you actually have four different lists of things that you want a single action to repeat over. You can do that by, uh, in the repeat, which you think of this as takes an array, you can pass it essentially an array of indexes. So you can pass it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then inside of the inputs, you can reference each of those array items uh, individually. 
So that's a, a neat little trick. Um, and then for conditionals, uh, you can uh, have them on actions, they act as uh, preconditions, so that the action will not execute uh, unless the condition is met. Uh, for triggers, uh, conditionals act a little differently in that uh, for a trigger, I can say, only trigger this workflow if this condition is met. Uh, so for example, uh, if I had made the polling on the Twitter search be a trigger, I could only trigger the workflow if the tweet had any retweets. Um, so it's a little different way to think about it. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about real quick is parameters. Uh, so parameters are particularly useful because they give you the capability to reuse values throughout a workflow. Uh, so let's take a look at this workflow that we have. And there's actually a couple parameters that we add for you uh, by default, uh, which you may have seen at the top. Um, and those parameters are the tokens. So we, we put the, the tokens in parameters. So that way, if I had, say, another Twitter step or another Dropbox step that I added, we wouldn't have to copy that value all the way through the flow. We can actually reference the parameter here. So this is just what a parameter looks like. Um, it just appears at the top of the flow. And you could create your own parameters very easily uh, in this code view. Uh, so I could just do like topic. And then parameters are strongly typed. So you have to give it a type, say, Oops. String. And then you can provide a default value for the parameter. Um, and if I can type properly. So in Microsoft Azure, right? Um, so what we've done here is now I can actually reference this elsewhere in the flow. So there's a couple places. For example, I could put it here. I could type the parameter here. So I can do this. And then I can type parameters. Things are a little slower than I would like. And then I can pass it. The, the parameter function just takes the name of the parameter. So, so I could do something like this. Yeah, whatever. I won't save it. But uh, imagine I typed properly there. Uh, and then I could reuse it down here as well. So that way, instead of defining the same string multiple times, I can use it uh, throughout the flow. Now, the other thing that parameters are very useful for is they allow you to separate out config from the actual definition. So for those parameters that I just showed, I was uh, actually including the value in the workflow definition. But you don't have to do that. What you can do is every time that you create a workflow, you can pass the parameters in. Um, and that's particularly useful. Let's say that you have a definition that you want to use for both an internal environment and a production environment. In that scenario, you would take the endpoint out. So you'd have a parameter called, say, endpoint. And when you instantiate that workflow in prod, uh, you wouldn't have the endpoint hard coded. You would use a parameter called endpoint, and you'd pass in the parameters being mysite.net. But when you instantiate that workflow in the dev environment, you'd pass an int.mysite.net or whatever it is, uh, which allows you to not have to worry about um, you know, having a whole bunch of different definitions to deal with. And the next thing I want to talk about real quick is messages. So uh, we do have large message support built into to Logic Apps. Uh, so uh, you can pass messages that are up to 100 megabytes. We don't necessarily recommend that you do this. You're generally going to see better performance uh, if you externalize the state. So if you don't need to pass it all in one message, if you simply, in your workflow, pass, say, a URL that points to a blob that contains a message, that will be better. And that will also allow you to scale uh, beyond the 100 megabyte limit. Um, but uh, if you do, uh, you can. And the, the other thing to keep in mind is, because workflows uh, are JSON, uh, if you do have a binary blob, you have to base64 encode it before you can pass it into the workflow. Um, and the 100 megabyte limit is on the, the blob after it's been base64 encoded. So there is a little bit of a penalty there. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, I think I've mentioned this all as well, is all messages are archived. Um, but the retention period of the messages does depend on uh, what plan you get. So for the free plan, the archiving is much shorter than the, than, than the, than the longer plans. Uh, finally, I want to talk about some debugging tips that uh, the people have uh, 
found over the course of the past couple of weeks. Um, the first is that you can actually call the API apps directly uh, while you're trying to, to figure out what parameters you want to pass, for example. Uh, so Postman, which I think you saw a little bit of earlier, is a great tool for that. So for example, here's this, uh, this API app. And uh, you can actually construct the URL uh, from, the, from the flow definition. It's just the name of the API app and the name of the operation. And then you do pass in. These are the exact parameters I had in the workflow definition. I can just click Send, and I can see what this returns. Um, so let's say I wanted to see, hey, are there, are there actually a lot of tweets about logic apps? And I can, um, let's see if it works. Yeah, it does work. Um, of course it works. Why wouldn't it work? Uh, let's see if anybody is tweeting about logic apps. And I can come in here. And uh, yeah, that's a, uh, I, I like that. Uh, so you can see I, I can come in and I can vary these inputs very quickly. I can iterate. I can find the exact values that I want. And then I could go to my workflow and save this. So that just makes things a bit easier to debug. Um, uh, another great tool is called Request Bin. Um, so let's see if I have that up. And Request Bin is great uh, if you want to be able to inspect the uh, exact payload that you're receiving or that you're sending. Uh, and with Request Bin, uh, well, all it does is it just gives you a HTTP endpoint that you can use at, uh, to post to. Um, so if I were to paste this, I could paste this into my workflow. And when I do, I will actually see the exact headers that I get, the exact response that it gives, um, which just makes it a little bit easier to figure out what's going on. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend is uh, the API apps all run on, on Azure Web Apps, which means that you can enable logging there, and you can go in and you can see exactly uh, what's happened if you uh, save your logs off to, into Azure Storage. Uh, so that covers uh, all of the things I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs>